All Christians are called to evangelize. Now, like I said previously, is that not all specialize like an evangelist does in that particular area, but we are all called to evangelize. We are all called to share our witness of what Jesus Christ has done for us, and we are called to share the gospel with those who need it. Amen? Yes. That is the duty of every Christian. It is what the Great Commission is founded on. And so we see that when we start to evangelize, that good things happen. People give their hearts to the Lord and people's, people are changed. Even sometimes whole cities and societies are changed because of the gospel coming there. But let's not think that there is not a, uh, I hate to say a negative side, but a negative side to evangelism because there are often people when you evangelize reject the Word of Christ. Amen? And they don't like what is said. And many people oppose what is said. And as we see here, as was read in our text, that here the king, King Herod, stretched out his hand and killed James with the sword. Amen? Is that they didn't like what James was doing, so they took James's life. So you must understand that being a child of God and bringing forth the gospel into the nations can be a very dangerous thing to your health. But it's what you're called to do. Amen? Now listen, <clears throat> when a soldier signs up to be a soldier in whatever army he goes into, it is understood that you could possibly give your life in battle. You're a soldier. That's what soldiers do. They fight and they die. Many of us in here have seen war movies out the wazoo. People die in war. We even have some veterans in here. People who have been in military service. People die in war. And you've got to understand and you've got to arm your mind with this is that it is part and parcel of the child of God to be persecuted and to give your life for the Lord. You may be called upon to do that. You may not. But understand this, that don't think it's a strange thing, this fiery trial that befalls you. Amen. Because it is part of being a child of God. We're not used to it because we live in a, for the most part, Christian country based upon Christian values, our law system, our, our mindsets are mostly Christian here in this country. But like I said, when you start going to other places in the world, those other places in the world are ruled by different types of governments, they are ruled by different religions, and most of them are hostile to the Christian faith. Now, Jesus really made no bones about you having to suffer persecution and tribulation for, him, for worshiping Him. Matthew 10, 16 through 22, I just want to read it to you. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. You shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And brother shall deliver up brother to death, and father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we should be no stranger to understanding that persecution and martyrdom is part of the Christian walk. And like I said, not all people will die for their faith. But most people in some form or manner will be persecuted for their faith. 
Okay? There's light persecution and there's heavy persecution. Amen? Someone simply making fun of you or making a joke or treating you badly uh, over you being a Christian is a light thing. Someone beating you, someone trying to kill you, someone taking your property, that's a heavy thing. Amen? And it happens to the Christian. Now, these people, Jesus, what we were talking about here, are persecuted for their faith. They're persecuted for what they believe. Acts 14, 20 and 21 through 22, he says, when, And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they were turned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. This is Paul and his bunch. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Now right there when he's talking about the faith, it's talking about the whole of the Christian life. It is talking about everything that we believe. And that you can be persecuted for what you put your trust, what you put your faith in. So you've heard the saying, what faith is he? Or what faith is she? Or what is your faith? Well, I'm of the Christian faith. And this one's of the Muslim faith. And this one's of the Buddhist faith. And so you see, this is how the word is used here, talking about the whole encompassing belief of the gospel of the Christian faith. Now in the Christian faith, we have certain teachings we put our belief in that we put our trust in, correct? We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He is God. We believe that He died on a cross as a sacrifice for our sins that we may have eternal life. We believe that there will be a resurrection one day, amen, and that we will receive glorified bodies. We believe the Word of God is the inerrant Word of God, the infallible Word of God. We believe that sin is wrong and that righteousness is good. Amen? Amen. That comprises our faith. That's part of our faith. Those are things we believe in and we trust in. And what happens is that as you believe that, as you speak that, and as you live that, there are people who are opposed to it. Their minds don't think like your mind. Their beliefs don't line up with your beliefs. And this is where the rub hits. This is where the friction happens. And we're about to see an example of it here in just a little bit in your Bible. Now, I want to... I want to simply read something to you. I believe the Lord gave it to me on the way over here. Talking about what faith is. Alright? Usually we believe faith is that I'm believing God, I'm trusting God to answer my prayer. Okay? That is part of faith. Is what will get you through a hard time in your life. Faith is simply trusting God through every circumstance in life whether He answers your prayers or not. Trusting Him that unanswered prayer is the helpful thing at that moment. Did you hear that? Let me read it to you one more time. Faith is simply trusting God through every circumstance in life, whether He answers your prayer or not. Trusting Him that unanswered prayer is the helpful thing at that moment. How many times do you think in the heart of the prophets that they were imprisoned for what they spoke, that they were saying, Lord, get me out of here. But yet, they sit in the cell still. Paul says that I entreated the Lord three times that this thorn in my flesh would be removed. And he's not talking about a literal physical thorn in the flesh. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul says, I'll trust Him. You see, faith goes deeper than getting your prayers answered. Faith is trusting God with no matter what comes down the pipe and holding to Him no matter how it turns out. 
Because I guarantee you, each and every one of you in here have gone through things that you had rather not gone through and didn't turn out the way you liked it to turn out. But at the end of it, you're still holding to Jesus Christ. That's faith. You got that. God never told us that He was going to bend to our every whim. God is sovereign. He knows what He's doing. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways above our ways. And if God does not choose to answer at a particular time, or to pull you out of a bad situation in a particular time, it is your faith to trust Him in that. And say, Lord, I put my life, I put my money, I put my family, I put my livelihood in Your hands. That's faith. Faith is not working yourself into a frenzy and quoting Scripture until you think you've got so much faith that just things are going to start popping out of thin air. That's not faith. You're not going to get everything you ask for from God because He knows more than you. He's smarter than you. And you need to thank God, thank God that He doesn't answer every prayer that you ask for. Now, for persecution to be true suffering for Christ, it must be for the faith. 1 Peter 4 and 14. Listen to this. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part He is evil spoken of, but on your part He is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, Peter's making a good point here. He's saying that if you wind up in jail or you get your head beat because you've done something bad, you're not suffering for God. You're suffering because of your own stupid sinful mistakes. You got that. And so don't think that if you go to prison for theft or for murder that you're suffering for the Lord. You're suffering for your own bad decisions. Amen? Amen. So, for it to be true persecution, it has to be what you believe is right, that is the Bible, and standing for that. Amen? Amen. That is true persecution. Now, let's go into what the definition of persecution is. Persecution is to actively pursue someone to afflict them and to drive them away. Okay? Persecution is to actively pursue someone to afflict them and to drive them away. Persecution is hate in action because of what someone believes. Let me give you an example of this. Any of y'all ever had an old mangy dog show up in your yard? I've had them rip my trash up, make me so mad. If I'd have had a gun in my hand, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have done it ever again. I promise you. But when that old dog shows up in your yard, you know he's not there for good. And so what do you do? You step out of the house, you grab rocks, you grab sticks, you throw it at him. Get out of here, you mangy mutt. Go on. And you scare him off. This is the idea of persecution. Is that you are actively chasing, pursuing to afflict verbally and physically. You see what I'm saying? And your motive is hate. You see, when you love someone, you don't treat them that way. When you hate someone, you treat them that way. 
you treat them badly. Now, persecution is used to remove someone, to remove their beliefs, and to remove their presence or what their presence represents. You see, we've had in our country not, not long ago all these BLM riots and Antifa riots, and one of their main little doodads was to go out and tear down statues. Why did they tear down statues? Because that statue represented something they did not like. They persecuted it. They hated it. And when you represent something that people do not like, a lot of times persecution comes your way. Now, not only is it for those, but also persecution is used to remove a person from what they believe. Is that we're going to make it so hard on you that you're just going to recant your ideas and your beliefs on this. See, back long ago, in the Spanish Inquisition, all the Catholics got together and decided anybody who didn't believe like they believed was going to get put in a dungeon and tortured until they recanted their beliefs. Persecution is they're trying to separate you from your belief. Now, persecution may drive you from a people group. It may drive you from the land or state or country. And it also may drive you from the earth by death. Now, at the first Christian martyr, and since this is the, the, the first instance of a Christian martyr in Scripture, I think there's a pattern here we can, we can learn from. Amen? Let's uh, read Acts 6, 1 through 8, and then I'm going to make some comments on it and we'll go a little bit further. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, here we have a a division in the early church. Now these Grecians here, they were not Greek people, they were Greek Jews. And when I say Greek Jews, I mean Hellenistic Jews. They had adopted some of the Greek culture, they spoke Greek, and they use the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Septuagint is the Old Testament translated into Greek. Okay, And there was a dislike between the Hebrew Christians, the ones that were raised there in Judea and Jerusalem, and the Grecian Christians or the Hellenistic Christians, those that were raised outside. Okay, And so there's a division here. And what's happening is, is that mostly it seems that the Hebrew Christians, uh, the, the, uh, the ones that were trained up in the law around Judea, was showing favoritism. And they were helping the Jewish, the, excuse me, the Hebrew widows and not the Hellenistic widows. All right? Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Well, four brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, there were thousands of Christians at this time, so Stephen had to be a good man. He had to stick out from the bunch for them to pick him. And we see here that he was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Is that Stephen's life, his reputation preceded him in the church at this point. And they chose Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. 
And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now it was believed because of the name of Stephen that he was a Hellenistic Jewish Christian. Okay? Stephanus. Stephanus means it's a, it's a crown. Okay? It's a victor's crown is what Stephanus means. And he also helped these people. He made sure that everything was done right and everyone was treated fairly. But what I really want you to see here is that he was found working miracles. He was found teaching. He was found doing the work of the Lord. And he didn't have apostle by his name. He didn't have prophet by his name. He didn't have evangelist by his name nor pastor or teacher by his name. Is that this man just decided, hey, I'm serving food in the food pantry, but you know what? God can use me for more than just that. And he went out giving his witness to Jesus Christ in the gospel, and lo and behold, we see miracles and wonders done at the hands of Stephen. So that lets you know something. To be used of God, you don't have to have some high position or big name. You just got to be willing to get out there and do it. And I'm saying, be willing to get out there and do it. Amen? Now, Stephen was one of the seven who oversaw the food distribution to the Jewish widows. He was full of the Holy Ghost, faith, wisdom, and power. He worked wisdom, or excuse me, worked wonders and miracles. And the Bible says he was honest. Now, we're going to see something here. Is that as Stephen chose to go out of the four walls of the church, out of those assemblies, and to bring the gospel to other people, trouble happens. Now we in our thinking, a lot of times I'm doing a good work, I'm preaching the gospel, man I ought to have my name in lights, people ought to be throwing money at me, I ought to have a good reputation, drive fine, fine cars and live in good houses. But here Stephen, doing the work of the Lord, finds himself in a very different situation. Let's read 6 through 9. Or uh, nine, uh, 9 through 10, excuse me. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Let's talk about a synagogue for a minute. Is that synagogues were brought about and put throughout the land for Jews to come together to have, a, to have a, a community and to where they could learn and hear the Scriptures. Also many times schools were set up for children in the synagogue, the Jewish children. And so when you had synagogues in Jerusalem and there were many, what the thing was is, is that these synagogues were kind of partitioned off according to the people who gathered there. Okay? You had the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and different places of that nature and different people. It's because that from when they would come to Jerusalem to worship, in order to have people there who spoke the same language, because they all did not speak Hebrew, okay? Some spoke Greek, some spoke other languages. And so they would have community there. And so all these different people come to these synagogues and there Stephen is preaching the gospel. And as he's preaching the gospel and discussing Jesus Christ with these people from these different synagogues, what happens? There's a dispute. There's a disagreement. Let's read. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now, this dispute that they had, we're going to find out, was over who Jesus Christ was and what He was going to do in the future. And so, what started persecution? Disagreement. 
Simply, that's what it was. As Christianity was breaking from the Jewish religion, we see the rub and the butting of heads. Because Christianity and Judaism are not the same religion. Though Christianity has its roots in the Old Testament, has its roots in the law, it's not the same religion. Understand this. The Jews do not believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They do not believe He's the Son of God. As a matter of fact, they believe that to the point that they put Him on a cross. Do you see that? And so, as you see here the beginning of the schism, because they all looked the same and they all kind of acted the same and they all kind of believed the same, but this question of Jesus pops up. And bad things come from it. Now, let's look at the dirty, underhanded things that, the, uh, that these people from the synagogues do. Let's read 11 through 14. And they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witness which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered. That word suborned there, this is what it means. Is that those men from those synagogues in secret got together and they conspired to lie and to twist the truth on Stephen. That's what they did. Not only did they lie and twist the truth on Stephen, they stirred up the people, the citizens, and they got the government involved. The scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers. Looking kind of familiar, ain't it? Kind of seeing that a whole lot in America right now, aren't we? Some years ago, There were two homosexuals that walked into a bakery and they wanted a cake celebrating their homosexual union. Okay? No such thing as a homosexual union. It's called sin is what it's called. And the baker was a Christian. They said, I'll give you a cake, sell it to you, you can decorate it any way you want but I'm not decorating that cake for a homosexual marriage. The homosexuals go to court and try to get this man in trouble, drain him, sue him of his money, take what he has, because why? They had a difference of belief. This is how sorry the devil is working through people. And why do they try to get the government involved? Because the government can hurt you and they can stay without any harm. You got that? As they can hide behind justice, lying and twisting the truth, And they'll feel no hurt. And you'll receive all the pain for it. If you'll read this, you'll notice that they keep saying, he's saying blasphemous words. Blasphemous words against Moses and against this place. Blasphemous words. Why does this word keep coming up? Because under the law of Moses, blasphemy is punishable by death. These men were not looking to take his money. They were not looking to take his reputation. They were looking to take his life. 
And so you got to understand that many times when persecution comes, it is that people trying to use the government to get you to fall in line with what they think is right. But our God doesn't tell us to fall in line with that. If a person or the government is trying to get you to go against the laws of God, then you disobey the government. Because when you die, you're not going to answer to Congress. You're not going to answer to the courts. You're not going to answer to the president. You're going to answer to Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate judge. And so, there comes a point in time, and it has throughout all history, that a Christian or Christians must decide upon civil disobedience based on the Word of God. Now, persecution does not just come through the government, though many times it does. It can come from an individual. Or it can come from a mob. You see what I'm saying? Is that Satan is none too picky on how he persecutes as long as he persecutes. And he would love to use a family member because he knows that will hurt you more. And what did Jesus say here? That a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And that son will offer up father to death. You see that? The Jews, many times when they would accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, they would be shunned by their community. They would hold mock funerals for those people who accepted Christ. Saying, you're dead to me. No more. And so, when they accepted Christ, they lost property, reputation, houses, friends, and family. And that's what the church was there to do, was to help those who were transitioning in that way. You see, amongst us, Here in America and many Christian families, when someone comes to the Lord, we're happy. It's a celebration. And it should be that way. But you know, a sinner who got saved coming home to a sinning family may just lose that family. And the church has got to be there to help. That's why we see, part of the reason why we see in the early book of Acts, that all had in common, and that they went and sold properties and gave the money to the apostles so that people that were in these situations could be helped. Amen? So let me repeat a little something. If a group doesn't like what is done or said, they try to use the government to wrongly shut up and persecute those who they oppose. So they may stay free, although guilty of murder. You see that. Is that even though they were free after Stephen's death, they were all guilty of murder. They bore false witness to get this man put to death. You see that. Same thing happened with Jesus. They had a mock trial. They put him up there before Pilate. They brought him before Herod. They did all these things to him. And they had nothing that they could crucify him on. But yet, they pressed and they pressed and they pressed. So understand that many times, persecution will come through the government. And as evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, it will grow in America. If God don't do something quickly, 
then it's very possible that me and you could end up in prison, devoid of our property, possibly our lives, because we have held to the faith of Jesus Christ. And we saw not long ago how heavy-handed and stiff-armed the American government can get with all these COVID mandates and vaccines and passports and everything like that. Is that they're trying to squeeze you into their mold. They don't care about what you think. They don't care about your conscience. They want to control you. And thank God we weren't in Australia or Canada because they did put those people in camps who refused COVID vaccines. And y'all, I, I wouldn't, don't think this is over. Don't think it's over. Now, we conduct ourselves in persecution. Acts 7, and I'm coming to a close. We won't, we won't be here long. Maybe I should have stayed longer on this than I did the rest, but Acts 7, 54. I'm going to have to go to it. I didn't put it in there. Acts 7, 54. Now here we got Paul standing before the crowd. They've accused him of blasphemy. And they're about to put him to death. It says, And when they heard these things, and when, they gave Steve, when Stephen gave his defense, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he had died. That's what fall asleep there means. So how do we conduct ourselves during persecution and martyrdom? Number one I want you to see is that Stephen held fast to his faith in the face of death. One, you don't recount your faith in Jesus Christ. You got that. Don't think about taking the easy road out. Go on and go through with it. <laughs> a lot easier said than done but I'm going to tell you that's what you need to do there were many Christians back in the day of Rome that would just simply go ahead and pinch the little incense and throw it on the fire and say Caesar's God and go on and about their lives and then there were Christians that when they took those senses that says Caesar's not God and I'm not offering incense to him because I only serve one God and those people were thrown to the lions and killed by gladiators and tortured before the audience of the Colosseum. I had much rather know that my soul is secure in heaven then trade it for a few more years in this life. Amen. Two, you got to forgive. 
Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's our example. Stephen says, lay not this sin to their charge. So you got to forgive. Once again, not easy. But God can give you the grace to do it. And thirdly, know this, is that Christ is with you during this time. Stephen looked into heaven as he's about to die and sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. Huh? Now he's usually sitting. But they said he's standing. That means this had Jesus' full attention. Huh? That means you can be assured that when this time comes, He'll be there for you. Yes, amen. That's right. Not only do we see this, we hear earlier in Matthew chapter 10 that He says, take no thought about what you're going to say. Is because the Spirit is going to give you what to say yes. in the time of your persecution. Amen. Huh? So don't think you're there alone. No, God there is with you. And if God there is with you, He can give you the grace, the power to do what is needed to be done yes. in that hour. Amen. I don't know that there's any greater witness to man to say that I love Jesus Christ than to give your life for Him. And y'all, we may have to do that one of these days. And Peter says, happy are you to get to do it. It's an honor. If Christ loved you so much when you were a sinner... to be nailed to an old rugged cross, how much more should we be willing to die for Him who gave Himself for us? And y'all, we got to change our thinking from that selfish, I love me, I love me, I love me, till I'm willing to give all to God. Go ahead, brother. That's right. That's right.